Distinguished colleagues, honorable ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon. Um, first of all, let me express my greatest pleasure and um, um, my greatest pleasure uh, to be uh, here uh, at this international conference as a speaker today. And um, as my main field of interest concerns international public law, especially international criminal law and international human rights law, I'm exhilarated to dedicate this lecture to human rights aspects of vaccination and to elaborate on the ECTHR's stance on this issue, withdrawing some conclusions on the court's presumable position on COVID-19 jabs. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me start my presentation with some terrific news. News that we were all waiting for so long. The coronavirus pandemic is officially over. According to the latest statement of the WHO, oh, sorry, can I have the remote control? Sure. <laughs> so, according to the latest statement of the WHO, uh, Secretary General issued on the 5th May 2023, COVID-19 is now an established and ongoing health issue which no longer constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. At this point, as we can leave this horrible period behind in the past, fingers crossed, we can enjoy and take advantages of the comfort of hindsight when it comes to analyzing legal aspects of the pandemic. Human rights features and vaccination issues are no exceptions. According to the latest WHO statistics, more than 3 billion vaccine doses have been administered worldwide so far, and of course, more and more boosters are yet to come. Even though this number is clearly considerable, I'm quite sure we all remember the heated public debates that were going on COVID-19 vaccines, let alone compulsory ones. In that time, I wondered whether compulsory coronavirus jabs were compatible with the ECHR, and now I identify this question as a starting point of my presentation. Besides, I would also like to address another question here. If any compulsory vaccines are compatible with the convention, what are the circumstances that can verify them? Let's find out. Before turning to vaccinations, we should do a stock taking and take into account the legal aspects related to the ECHR raised by the coronavirus pandemic. From my point of view, there are three main issues here to be mentioned. First, derogations from the ECHR under Article 15 in officially declared public emergency. During the COVID-19 pandemic, 10 contracting states, as you can see on the slide, notify the Secretary General of the Council of Europe to derogate from the Convention. Second, applications reaching the ECTHR relating to the COVID-19 health crisis. These cases raise questions under a number of provisions of the Convention, the right to life, the prohibition of torture and other forms of ill treatment, the right to liberty and security, the right to a fair trial, the right to respect for private lives, life, and so on and so forth. And third, as far as compulsory vaccinations are concerned, the ECTHR received several requests for interim measures in connection with vaccination schemes lodged by doctors, other medical employees, firefighters, and so on, challenging mandatory jabs, while some other requests challenge the use of COVID-19 certificates as a precondition of using public transport. Nonetheless, these requests were rejected under Rule 39 by the court. Two applications relating to mandatory coronavirus vaccinations Zambrano versus France and Tevenon versus France 
were found to be inadmissible in particular for the failure of exhausting domestic remedies. So, let me get this straight. There has been no judgment in the ECTHR's case law on compulsory COVID-19 vaccinations yet. However, the court delivered a judgment on compulsory childhood vaccinations two years ago, as the Wawrzyczka and others versus the Czech Republic seems to be a landmark decision on this field. Therefore, I am going to discuss this case study in my presentation, and in the end, I'm going to use it as an analogy for coronavirus jabs. On 8th April 2023, in Grand Chamber judgment in the Wawrzyczka case, the court had, by majority, 16 votes to 1, that there had been no violation of Article 8, right to respect for private life of the ECHR. Although this case had nothing to do with the coronavirus pandemic, I cannot help but think it through what reasoning the court would give on compulsory COVID-19 vaccinations based on this decision. The timing of the Wawrzyczka judgment is noticeable. Delivering such a decision in a time of a raging pandemic might have an elephant in the room type of message. Before starting the analysis of the case study, we should clarify um, three substantial preliminary features of the Wawrzyczka case that are different from the coronavirus scenarios. First, in the center of this case, there were routine vaccinations that are well known for medical science for a long time. Second, in Wawrzyczka, compulsory meant that as a consequence of non-compliance, administrative fine had been borne by the parents and it meant by no means forced vaccination. And third, leading roles were played by child applicants in this case Therefore, additional relevant questions rose regarding the parents' right to respect for private life, namely freedom of parenting and child care. First and foremost, I should devote some time to address the principal facts of the Wawrzyczka and others versus the Czech Republic. The case originated from six applications one of them was lodged by a father, Mr. Pavel Wawrzyczka, who, having omitted to have his children vaccinated, was found to have committed minor offense. In 2003, Mr. Wawrzyczka was fined for refusing to have his two children, then aged 13 and 14, vaccinated against three diseases and prescribed under sorry, as prescribed under domestic law, and the appeals lodged by Mr. Wawrzyczka against the decision were dismissed by the domestic courts. Once again, it is worth noting at this point that under Czech law, the vaccination duty concerned vaccination against nine diseases plus one for children with special health conditions that have been well known for medical science for decades or even centuries. Okay, now let's move on to the findings of the court where there are four questions to be answered. The first one is whether there was an interference into the right to respect for private life. According to the ECTHR's case law, compulsory vaccination as an involuntary medical intervention represents an interference with the right to respect for private life. The scope of the right to private life is quite extensive since it is applicable to numerous life situations and it encompasses individual self-determination. As um, medical interventions necessarily affect the letter including bodily integrity, they have to be based on informed consent. As a general rule, 
patients have the right to refuse informed consent, nevertheless, the right to respect for private life isn't an absolute one. It can be subject to limitations, and there can be cases when medical intervention is compulsory even without informed consent. Question number second, number two, whether the aim pursued by the interference was legitimate. The aim of the relevant domestic legislation was to protect against diseases which could pose a serious risk to health. This referred to everyone, both to those who received the vaccinations concerned and gained direct protection, as well as those who could not be vaccinated, for example, due to their health, special health conditions, and were thus in a state of vulnerability, relying on the attainment of a high level of vaccination within society at large uh, for indirect protection against the contagious diseases in question. This objective corresponds to the aims of the protection of health and the protection of the rights of others recognized by Article 8. Question number three, whether compulsory vaccination is necessary in a democratic society? For the assessment of compulsory vaccination's necessity, both the convention institutions, I mean the commission and the court as well, uh, had developed a number of criteria in their jurisprudence. In both and others versus San Marino and in Solomakin versus Ukraine, the convention institutions examined whether public health considerations necessitated the control of the spreading of infectious diseases and, respectively, whether necessary pre uh, precautions had been taken with regard to the uh, suitability of vaccination for the individual cases at hand. In Wawrzyczka, the ECTHR further specified these criteria and thoroughly assessed the state's margin of appreciation, the notion of pressing social need, as well as relevant and sufficient reasons. In this regard, the court also underscored that contracting states are under a positive obligation to take appropriate measures to protect the life and health of uh, those within their jurisdiction. Question number four. <coughs> Ultimately, the court examined whether the interference relating the aim pursued was proportionate. It found that the vaccination duty under national legislation concerned diseases against which vaccination considered to be effective and safe by the scientific community Moreover, that domestic law enshrined exceptions on the grounds of contraindications or con uh, science and is also provided for compensation in case of injury caused by the jab. The ECTHR underlined that CHE law did not allow vaccines to be forcibly administered and finally, it highlighted that the competent authorities had taken necessary precautions, such as the monitoring of the safety of the vaccines and the assessment of possible contraindications in each case. So, how to sum my presentation up? How can we draft the ECTHR's presumable position on compulsory COVID-19 vaccines? Although in Wawrzyczka, the court did not leave much room for generalizations, the court's analysis in several places serves as a detailed explanation of the criteria already established for assessing the need for compulsory vaccination in democratic societies and the compatibility of compulsory vaccination against coronavirus with the convention. Among the ECTHR's conclusions on margin of appreciation in Wawrzyczka, it is relevant that there is 
a consensus between states and the WHO on the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines, while, on the other hand, there is no interstate consensus on the mandatory use of vaccination. These considerations, together with the ECTHR's finding that domestic authorities are in the best position to decide on priorities, lead to the conclusion that the introduction of compulsory vaccination against coronavirus is a matter of state's discretion. In Vavzicka, the Grand Chamber also pointed out that in contracting states with a vaccination policy favoring voluntary vaccination, the decline in vaccination uptake and in the vaccination coverage of the population is considered to be of overriding social interest and in cases where the nature of the disease does not allow for herd immunity, just like COVID-19, compulsory vaccination can be reasonably used to maintain an adequate level of protection. As for proportionality, the possibility of uh, exceptions in the case of medical contraindications or con um, conscientious objections, the individualized assessment of the suitability of vaccination and the existence of a legal remedy for compensation in the event of damage to health caused by uh, the jab are essential factors. In conclusion, the contours of the Vavzicka case suggest that compulsory COVID-19 vaccination is in line with the ECHR if the vaccine is considered to be safe by the scientific community. Second, administered only indirectly by the state. For third, the health authorities take the necessary precautions which are reflected in particular individualized assessment. And last but not least, the legislator also provides for the possibility of claiming compensation in the event of damage to health caused by the vaccine. Well, um, this brings me to the end of my uh, presentation. So there's nothing left but to say thank you, all of you, for your kind attentions. Uh, and um, uh, questions and remarks uh, are welcome. And save the best for last. Bon appetite for all of us. Thank you.